evening's event uh, features quite an, an accomplished couple. Amy Chua and, and Jed Rubenfeld are both Yale Law professors and uh, very experienced authors. Uh, Amy's last book, of course, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, stirred up lots of heated discussion about strict parenting. But she's also written a couple of more historical books uh, on the rise and fall of empires and, and on attempts to spread democracy and, and free markets. Uh, Jed, for his part, has authored two books on constitutional law and two popular suspense novels. Uh, and this is not the first time uh, that either of them has been here. Amy uh, has appeared at PNP and twice before, and Jed uh, once before. And now uh, they've joined forces uh, in writing the triple package, uh, which identifies three psychological characteristics that together uh, uh, they say, determine whether a person, a cultural group, uh, even a country succeeds. Trying to explain why certain people or groups do better than others in America is, as Amy and Jed acknowledge at the outset, a touchy subject. Uh, and sure enough, their book has landed them in the middle of some pretty heated controversy, uh, with critics accusing them of cultural stereotyping and, and questionable scholarship. But the authors say at the start uh, of, of their book that their objective was, in fact, to debunk such stereotypes. And their arguments, while provocative, if you read them, uh, certainly don't come across as racist or ethnically prejudiced or, or intended to be the final word. Uh, we're very glad to be able to give Amy and Jed a forum here this evening to explain their conclusions uh, and to hear um, your, your own views. Uh, so please join me in welcoming both of them. Thanks, Bradley. Thank you all for uh, coming out tonight. Thank you for having us to this famous bookstore. I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened to us like three or four weeks ago. We were uh, at a coffee shop in New Haven. We happened to overhear a, a couple talking, and the woman said, did you hear about the two professors who are making the argument that some races are superior to others? And, you know, aghast, we interrupted them and demanded to know who the despicable professors were. <laughs> and the woman answered, well, it's a tiger mom. <laughs> and the speechlessness on our faces apparently made her think initially that we didn't know who that was. Because she answered, she answered, oh, you know, it's that crazy Chinese woman and her white and that was how this odyssey began for us over the last four weeks where we had repeatedly to hear about a book which had not been published and had not been read by the thousands of people saying what they were saying about the book, calling it names, and describing a book which we literally could not recognize as the book we had written. So it's a great pleasure for us to be here tonight to have a chance to say what we think the book is really about, which is the rise and fall of groups. It's a book about three qualities that propel individuals and groups to success and about the very predictable way that that success and those qualities erode over time, both as a result of success itself and as a result of a process of a kind of creative destruction that happens when these qualities collide with and interact with American culture. The starting point for our book is a remarkable fact, a seemingly un-American fact about America today. It's the fact that despite the tough economy, rising inequality, shrinking opportunities, some groups are doing much better than the national average, are experiencing much higher rates of exceptional upward mobility than the rest of the country. And this is, it's a fact that we have to contend with. It's out there and we thought maybe it would be a good idea to try to understand this fact better because maybe we could all learn from it. Now let me just give you a sense of the kind of facts that we're talking about because they're jarring. Some of them you might have heard before, some of them you might not. So Indian Americans, earn almost double the national figure when it comes to median household income, about $90,000 for Indian Americans to about $50,000 for uh, the rest of the country. Lebanese Americans and Iranian Americans are not far behind in terms of income. 
Asian Americans, their kids score 140 points higher on the SATs on average than the rest of the country. Asian American college age kids, though about 5% or a little less than 5% of the rest of the country, are so disproportionately overrepresented at, uh, 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 at our very best universities, are almost 20% of the Ivy Leagues, even though many people think that that number is artificially suppressed by a bias against Asian Americans. Now, how about this? I'm not sure that you will have known this. What do the following companies uh, 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 have in common? Talking about the current or recent CEOs or CFOs of American Express, uh, Black & Decker, Citigroup, JetBlue, Dell, Fisher-Price, Sears, Roebuck, Skull Candy, Huntsman. This list, I could go on and on. And what they have in common is they're run by Mormons. Now, this is really quite remarkable because 30 years ago on Wall Street, and I know this because I, I practiced on Wall Street 30 years ago, it was difficult to find a Mormon. It was difficult to find a Mormon in a powerful position in a corporate boardroom. But now today, they're really uh, 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 hitting it out of the park in terms of corporate success. Why? How does that happen? Jewish success is the best documented and the most fraught. I won't go into the, the details at all, but just, just to scratch the very surface of it, Jewish Americans, though less than 2% of the US population, have earned more than a third of America's Nobel Prizes and comprise a third right now of the uh, seats on the uh, United States Supreme Court. Now, you talk about these facts of group differences and it's uncomfortable. And part of the reason why it's uncomfortable is because people feel it's racially charged. But when you look at the actual facts, they explode racial stereotypes. As we show in the book, there are African American and Hispanic American groups who are among the top performers, outperforming the national average, outperforming the white average. Immigrant groups from uh, uh, Ghana, Jamaica, the most prominent though are Nigerians, and we focus the, on them in our book, are climbing the educational ladder and remarkably outperforming the national average in many respects. Cuban Americans are another example. And let me tell you what I thought of as one of the most interesting things that we found in the course of our whole research. So I just told you about Asian Americans scoring better on their SATs, and educationally speaking, it's not a stereotype, it's just a fact. Grades are higher, scores are higher. When researchers dug down below and really looked at the data, they found that third generation Asian American youth performed no differently from the rest of the country. I'm going to just repeat that. Third generation Asian American kids do not outperform the rest of the country. Why is that important? Because it demonstrates it's not genetic. It demonstrates it has nothing to do with biology. It has nothing to do with race. It totally explodes the model minority stereotype. What it tells you is that there's something going on in the cultures of these groups. If we could peel back the curtain and look at what's going on in the cultures of that first and second generation in the family, maybe we could learn something that we could all benefit from. Now, I'll tell you what I'll bet some of you are thinking, because <clears throat> it's the most comforting explanation. You'll want to say, you know what, it's all about immigrant selectivity. It's all because certain immigrant groups come over with a higher education and higher income. So it's all about class and immigrant selectivity. The only problem is, and those factors are important, don't get me wrong, they're important. They're just not nearly as important as people think. They simply cannot explain the facts on the ground. And let me tell you why. First of all, they can't capture Mormons or Jews. Mormons are not immigrants. Jews were immigrants, but now in America, they're mostly third, fourth, fifth generation not an immigrant group. The Mormons who are doing so well in business today, their parents were very, came from very humble origins. One study found that about 90% of the wealthy Mormon businessmen today came from very humble origins. So class isn't doing the work there too. The Jews who rose in the middle of the 20th century, their parents were very poor and often very poorly educated. But most of all, the immigrant selectivity hypothesis, that explanation, you know what else it can't explain? the success of Chinese American and certain other East Asian American uh, uh, communities. And the data are in on this. This group has been studied because there are hundreds of thousands. They've been studied in Los Angeles, in New York, in Toronto, and in the UK, and every single place the finding is as follows. First, about half of them don't come in on the education or skills visa. But their kids, and we're talking about restaurant workers, dry cleaners, the kids of, of those people, even though some of them are barely literate and they have very little money, they are doing just as well as the kids of the better educated Chinese and East Asian parents. So 
that's it, parental socioeconomic status is not doing the work, which is interesting all by itself. But more than that, they're doing better than their privileged, better educated white peers. That is, they're doing better than the kids of white parents who have a little more money and are better educated. And that's the phenomenon we wrote our book to try to explain. We are not, here's the misunderstanding of our book. Like, we're, we wrote a book to say, oh, you know, how come the Chinese American immigrant community is doing better than, you know, uh, inner city African Americans or rural Appalachians or some other group? That is not what we're talking about. The reason why one group who came in is doing better than another group who, that has a history of 200 years of slavery, discrimination, exclusion, and structural bias in the system against it, that's not difficult to explain. That, you don't need a book to be written about that. The phenomenon that deserves explanation is why their kids are doing better than their, the, the kids of the more privileged, better educated white parents. Are they doing something that we can all learn from? Well, if it's not race, if it's not skin color, if it's not genetic, if it's not parental background, if it's not class, if it's not immigrant selectivity, what is it? We found that it was culture, and, and to tell you more about what we found, here's Amy. So uh, picking up where Jed left off, what um, we decided to do is we decided to look at all these uh, the groups that are most disproportionately successful today. And I want to stress that this is just a snapshot. Um, the groups that are successful were different 20 years ago. They will be different 20 years from now. Uh, but we looked at these groups, and what we found is that for all their enormous diversity, I mean, what do Nigerian Americans you know, have in common with Mormons or Indian Americans? What we found is that for all their diversity, these groups all shared three qualities or cultural commonalities, and we call these the triple package. And the first of these qualities is a sense of exceptionality, of being special somehow. Now, there are many different sources for this sense of exceptionality. It doesn't have to come, it can't come from belonging to a certain group or to a certain family, but it can also come from just a parent that instills uh, this feeling of being special in their child. The second quality seems to be almost just the opposite. Uh, added to this sense of exceptionality is a dash of insecurity. And by this, we mean a feeling of not having done enough yet, not being good enough yet. And the third element is impulse control. That is self-discipline, the ability to persevere and resist temptation. And it's really the combination of those first two qualities that are at the crux of our book, that are most interesting to us. How do, what does it mean for somebody to simultaneously feel insecure and superior? And what we have found is that that weird combination is precisely what generates drive. This feeling that you, you need to show people, you need to prove yourself, you need to show the world. And I will, I'll come back to this later, but this, what I think all the other theories about successful groups, uh, the more politically correct ones, fail to account for is drive. You know, you can have all the education in the world. I mean, we all know as parents, how do you get motivated uh, a, a kid? So it's drive. Now, anyone of any background, any ethnicity, any religion can have all these three qualities. We spend a bit of time talking about Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who's uh, of Puerto Rican background. And, and uh, in her case, it was a grandmother that she writes about very movingly in her book, who just gave her that sense of, of being exceptional. Um, but so anyone can have these three qualities, but at this moment in time, some groups are instilling these three qualities in their members, in their kids, in their families, more than the rest of the country, and these groups are disproportionately succeeding, at least by conventional metrics. So we'll come back to that later, too. And in our book, we explore the absolutely fascinating, totally different ways or totally different forms that these qualities, these three qualities take. It's very different. So for example, the sense of exceptionality can be rooted in religion, as in the case of the Mormons, who have a very strong chosen people narrative, actually very much borrowed from the Jews. Um, 
Uh, but Mormons also take enormous pride in their strong families and clean-cut values. Uh, they believe they have uh, superior uh, moral values, in a sense. As one historian put it, they see themselves as an island of morality in a sea of moral decay. Totally different source of exceptionality. Persian Americans have a very strong sense of ethnic uh, uh, heritage and, and exceptionality. They are very proud of their ancient civilization. They identify as Persians who speak Farsi, not Arabic, uh, and are, see themselves as quite distinct from Arabs. Very similarly, Cuban Americans see themselves as distinct from other Hispanic Americans. And I highlight those last two examples deliberately because they highlight um, one of the great dangers of the superiority complex, right? This feeling of we are, we are very proud of our ethnic heritage, we have ethnic exceptionality, can very, very easily shade into intolerance. And that's very typical in that first generation, the immigrants that still have the accents that have just come over. And what you see, and this is the part of the process of creative destruction Jed was mentioning, is you see their children, the children of those immigrants, not liking that ethnic exceptionality so much. They're imbued with America's greatest value, the value of equality. They may not speak the language so much, so they reject some of that. They don't feel quite some of it uh, as intensely, and, um, and uh, that part, that superiority complex can erode. Uh, finally, a different form of superiority complex. Um, this is the case of uh, Asian Americans or East Asian Americans. Um, we're not using culture in this kind of essentialist sense of, you know, this Confucianism that's attached to a 5,000-year culture that can only some people can have. Um, it's really much more of a, a interaction with the homeland heritage and America. But in the United States, the um, Asian American, part of the exceptionality is rooted in a sense, we're better at working hard. We're better at excelling academically. Now, Superiority by itself um, is not a recipe for success. In fact, on the contrary, feeling superior is more likely to be a recipe for complacency. There was just a really interesting article, uh, a review in the Financial Times about, I think it's called something like Tiger Mother and the Graduates of Eton College in England. Um, but it specifically highlights this very, very well-educated privilege group that um, has a lot of superiority but is not particularly driven. So... Uh, what you it's only when this sense of superiority and exceptionality is combined with insecurity that you get this drive this kind of something's missing this goading need to prove yourself and to gain um respect and you'll note that all of America's disproportionately successful groups are outsiders in one sense or another. Uh, to go back to the case of the Mormons, they um even as they feel very exceptional, they also are feel not quite accepted by the mainstream. You know, uh, there are Christian denominations that see them as not quite Christian, maybe cultish, very, very acutely aware of a, a history of persecution. Um, Orrin Hatch used to say that uh, Mormons are the only church in this country that ever faced an extermination order. Now, more generally, to be an immigrant of any background is almost by definition to be insecure, to be, uh, they're the ultimate outsiders. You know, the people who don't know where anything is, you have the accents, uh, uh, you just don't quite fit in. And you also don't know if you can make it, you can provide for your children in a strange country. And right here, I just wanna add a personal note, um, because as Jed says, this book has been so uh, characterized in, uh, diff in the media in a different way than we intended. At a personal level, I'm speaking just for myself, I think not for Jed, um, for me, the book is in some ways, uh, it, it, it's in, in some ways about turning the sense of being an outsider or a minority into a source of strength. So I remember when I was little, you know, uh, it, this guy in fourth grade used to run around making slanty eye gestures in me, at me, and um, I had a strong Chinese accent back then, and I remember feeling bad about that and telling my mom, and I remember my mom being actually annoyed at me. And she said, why would you care about such a stupid person who is making those, you know, we come, you know, from the oldest, greatest, ancient, most ancient civilization. And if this person is so ignorant to be, you know, why would you even waste time thinking about that person? Now, obviously, that 
attitude has its own dangers of ethnocentrism, right? We all, I, I, I felt it even as a kid. But for a an eight-year-old child, that sense of incredible ethnic pride gave me a kind of armor, a kind of shield against majority prejudice. And this is actually a very typical phenomenon, um, the idea of a, an outsider, a minority, turning their heritage around into, into an armor. And Jed and I, you know, the conversation has been pretty much not what we thought it was going to be. We actually intended this book to be so much more broadly applicable than the conversation's been because there are so many minorities. Everybody's a minority and an outsider in the United States now. And we've just started to get in really interesting and kind of, I don't know, emails where we thought the conversation would be. So, for example, I got an email from somebody who was disabled. He's an amputee. Uh, and he wrote me and he said, I just, these three qualities resonate with my own life so much. Um, but for me, as for so many other disabled people, it's, it's being disabled and just not wanting to be pitied. I just hate being pitied. That has given me all this drive and desire to work 20 times harder than anybody else. And he said to me, when I, he, he's won all these prizes, he has hedge funds and six books. Um, uh, he said, when I ski as a one-legged skier, skied past, faster, the two-legged skiers, I did feel superior because I had earned it. I had, I'd, I'd earned it, you know, myself. And, you know, I, I was on Anderson Cooper where the conversation was kind of rough. I was attacked, you know, all this. That afterwards, Andrew Sullivan and Anderson Cooper said, I think this applies to gays. This is really interesting, you know, because a sense of insecure. And I don't know if they're right or not, but I just, I just wish I was like, why didn't you bring this up when we were on TV? Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I just, that's, a, so anyway, that is all a personal side, talking about um, the sense of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the rest of society that can actually interact with a sense of exceptionality um, uh, to create um, a motivation. I now want to talk about another kind of insecurity, equally important, but maybe more startling. And this is an insecurity created inside the family. That is basically parents making their children feel that they are not good enough yet. Um, and this idea, this idea of deliberately making your child feel this way is practically anathema to mainstream thinking. It is the exact opposite of the self-esteem movement. And yet every one of the groups that we look at essentially does this, but in totally different ways, totally different ways. So. In Asian American immigrant families, parents famously impose exorbitantly high academic expectations. Um, so the proverbial, why just a 99, why not a 100? And that is confirmed by hundreds of studies, right? I mean, obviously, there are always exceptions, but just sort of statistically. And again, that is a sense of that's not good enough. Um, studies also show that especially East Asian parents, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, are much more likely to make pointed comparisons to other successful kids. So, oh, I hear that so-and-so's kid just got into Harvard. Or, oh, your cousin just got valedictorian. Again, instilling that feeling that everybody else around you is doing better. You know, you're not good enough yet. And to further pile on in these families, academic success is often tied to family honor. If you don't do well, you're going to disgrace the whole family. I mean, talk about pressure. And this is not just Asian Americans. In a study of over 5,000 immigrant children, this is from all backgrounds, all continents, the children repeatedly said that they felt an acute anxiety that if they didn't succeed academically, they would be failing their parents and wasting all the sacrifice their parents had given. And again, this mentality is the exact opposite of what parents focused on, uh, you know, making their children just feel, uh, you know, self-esteem are trying to cultivate. And as Jed and I wrote in a New York Times op-ed, um, uh, somewhat provocatively, we wrote, there is an ocean of difference between this message sent by parents, you're amazing, mommy and daddy never want you to have to worry about a thing, and this parental message, if you don't do well at school, you'll let down the whole family and end up a bum on the streets. <laughs> Pretty harsh, 
uh, but uh, but definitely um, uh, lights a fire. Um, finally, the third element, I won't say much, impulse control. Um, all of America's most disproportionately successful groups right now very starkly tend to impose much more discipline and um, focused activities on their children at a very young age. Um, the Mormon case, we knew nothing about this. You know, even preschoolers, they are learned to tithe, to save money, um, learning to fast, learn to sit still for very long periods in church services. So these are the three elements of the triple package that we say, in combination, produce both a longing, a hunger to rise, in Tocqueville's terms, and the ability to rise. Now, before I turn um, this back over to Jed to conclude and um, to get your questions, I just want to say one more thing, and that is that we very deliberately chose our terms for the triple package. We could have made this a much more pleasant-sounding uh, sugarcoating book, which is what you need for conf uh, success is we could have called it confidence, grit, big dreams. We deliberately chose these terms that are very ambivalent, insecurity, impulse control, um, uh, uh, you know, superiority complex. And that is because we intended for this book to not be a celebration, a simplistic celebration of success or a simplistic celebration of the triple package. Um, we wanted it to be, and this is on the first page, um, Katie Royfe called it a, a meditation on success, but we wanted it to be kind of an honest view of what it means to be driven. Um, I, just think of all the most driven people you know. They're often not happy. There's something, I mean, to be driven, something has to be missing. By definition, something has to be pushing you. Something has to be pressuring you. And we actually spend more than half the book talking about sort of the psychological costs and the underside of this, exploring the pathologies. Um, you know, we have really interesting quotes. Vera Wang, uh, you know, my idol, I mean, she designs wedding dresses for Chelsea Clinton and Kim Kardashian. She's the life so many people want. In her personal interview, she talks about never pleasing her father who didn't want that career choice. And just, she says, I can never feel that I've done everything, anything well. I only focus on what I've done poorly. And then taken to the extreme, uh, Amy Chan actually wrote, I grew up thinking that I would never, ever please my parents. It's a horrible feeling. There are points where I wanted to die. So now, having said that, um, you know, at the extreme, how that feel, I also want to say that at the other extreme, I think we tend to romanticize um, uh, how easy it is to produce happiness in children. You know, there is nothing particularly happiness producing about not being able to get the job you want, about having a passion and not being able to get anybody to hire you to pursue that passion. Um, and this opposite of feeling like you're not good enough, you need to prove yourself, the exact opposite of that is feeling entitled. Because if you're entitled, you precisely don't need to prove yourself. You don't need to earn anything. And studies after studies have shown that people who feel very entitled have tremendous anxiety and problems with happiness also. Um, one last thing. Um, I know Jed's going to touch on it. But we've been questioned a lot about our definition of success. And I'll we'll, we'll have more to say about that. But you might be interested that one even when these three elements work very well, they don't produce depression, they don't produce too much anxiety, they generate success. Um, what we treat as a downside is that the kind of insecurity that drives the triple package, that is this need to show your parents that you are good enough, this need to show your neighbors, to prove to society, to be accepted, that tends to force people into very narrow, conventional, kind of prestige-oriented careers. How are you going to show everybody and be respected? You know, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer, something that everybody else acknowledges. And that can be extremely imprisoning for members of that group that don't want to be those things um, that their parents uh, see for them. <clears throat> you know, Amy was just, can you hear me OK? Do I need to use the microphone to? Yes. to yes. No. Yes. <laughs> um, Amy was just telling you something about how Asian families tend to communicate insecurity. So I got to tell you a little, I'm going to tell you a Jewish joke, OK? <laughs> so there's this Jewish joke, because there's a Jewish daughter who gets elected president of the United States. And she says to her mom, mom, you're going to come to the inauguration, right? And the mom says, the inauguration, do I have to come? It's going to be so much trouble. 
And the daughter says, of course, you have to come. It's the inauguration. It's my inauguration. And the mom says, OK, OK, I'll come, I'll come. So she comes to the inauguration. And her daughter's being inaugurated president in front of her. And she tugs the sleeve of the uh, guy sitting next to her. She says, you see that girl who's being inaugurated president? And the guy says, yeah, I see her. Her brother's a doctor. <laughs> and so, I mean, the communication, like, you get to be president. You could, could have been a doctor. But I'm sure she's telling the son, you're a doctor. You could have been president. Look at your sister. So it's not a book about parenting at all, I, I don't think. But it, it, there are many different ways that these... Uh, 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 qualities can be instilled, but what I want to do in just a few minutes, <clears throat> number, point number one, at the end of the day, this book is not about groups. I know we've been talking about groups a lot. We talk about groups as a way into the qualities that are propelling people to succeed. The identity of the groups change. If we had looked 20 years ago, it would have been totally different. The groups that we find now that are uh, more successful were different 20 years ago. We checked into it. A hundred years ago, totally different. 20 years from now, it will be different. The identity of the groups changed, the qualities seem to remain the same. And any individual from any group, from any back, doesn't matter what group you're from, can have these qualities. Many individuals who are not from any of the groups we focus on do have these qualities. Our, our president is one. In any given family, a parent, a strong parent, a grandparent, a teacher can instill these qualities. So I know what you're going to say. I know what you want to ask. So what are we saying about America's poor groups? OK, I'll tell you what we're saying. The causes of poverty are known to everyone. Exclusion, discrimination, denials of opportunity, macroeconomic changes that have wiped out whole economic sectors that have nothing to do with culture. Of course, that's obvious. But let's not fall into a false dichotomy. OK, here's the false dichotomy. People on the right say, the American economy is perfect. The meritocracy is perfect. The playing field is level. It's all about individual choice. Every outcome is solely based on an individual's personal responsibility and choice. And then the people on the left say, that has nothing to do with it. In fact, it's all about structure and social problems, structural bias. It has nothing to do with individual choice. Now, aren't we grown up enough to realize that it's got to be both, that there's an element of both? If you say to America's persistently low-income groups, it's all structural. It's all discrimination. It's all that the playing field isn't level. And all those things are true. And all those things have to be changed. We need social activism. We need to level the playing field. We need to get rid of discrimination. But if that's what you say, just wait for all those things to happen. Good luck. Wait 100 years. If you don't say, wait, there is something also that you can try to do for yourself, for your kids, if you don't add that point, is that respectful? Is that is that the message you want to confer? Isn't, if you don't add that point, isn't it actually a disparagement of the human spirit to say to people, you have no agency in your lives whatsoever? Now, I'm going to ask one other question, which I know you want to ask me, so I'm going to ask anyway, which is, how come we define success in this book in terms of material wealth? How could you be so dumb as to define success? Well, we don't define success that way. We don't. On page three of our book, we say everybody needs two kinds of educations, one to learn how to make a living, and the other to learn how to live. Triple package cultures are pretty good at the first one. They're not so good at the second one. Here's my definition of success, achieving your goals, whatever they are. Yes, we focus on income, educational achievement in the first four or five chapters of our book for very simple reasons. One, you can measure it. Two, because for most people, it is a goal that is important to them, as it should be. But we actually think that the qualities we're describing can help people achieve success of many different kinds, including the kind that is not measured by personal gain at all, but it's measured by your service to your community, your country. Look, one of the things we show in the book is this process of generational decline or, or generational change, a, a dynamic trajectory. And by the way, none of the other extant theories of group differences, group success can explain that generational decline, that generational trajectory. But what we're saying about that is there's this great thing that happens when these cultures, these groups collide with American society, American culture. This is that business about creative destru destruction that I was mentioning before. It's so common in the second generation of these groups. I'm talking about immigrant groups now, but this happens in many other uh, uh, communities too, that they turn around, they look at their parents, and they say, you know, we don't accept that superiority story you were telling us. 
We're not comfortable with that. That's a triumph of America. And they also say, we don't define success the way you were telling us to. You wanted us to be in those professions. We don't want to be. But the real promise is that if they can take some of these qualities and strengths that they may have gained through these triple package cultures, they can use that. By the way, I'm not sure, by the way, that I represent any of these three qualities. Well, I know I bring insecurity to the table, but the other two I'm not so sure about. But the real aspirations, if you can take these qualities and use them to help yourself achieve the goals that you set for yourself. So that the real promise of a triple package America, from our point of view, is a day when there aren't any more successful groups, when there are just individuals who are better able to achieve their own goals, to define success as they choose. Thanks. We'd love to have your questions. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> okay. A, a couple of a couple of small points, and then an integrative question. Uh, is it really true that uh, th th that white Christians are not fifty percent of the population now, rather than in the future? And two, when you re you reference lack of education in Jewish communities, you know, among the among the lower class immigrants, there was a very powerful education apart from how many years in school and that study of Torah among the Orthodox. Okay. The, the, the seeming uh, <clears throat> inconsistency of superiority and inferiority. I just have an hypothesis that I would be interested to hear, hear your, your, your response to. If there's a heritage of being in, in a superior group, like, like the Persians, like the Jews, like the this, whatever, uh, in previous generations, could that level of superiority combine more with an individual level of inferiority and if you put those, if you integrate those two, uh, that, that, the, the ideas would seem s seem less incompatible. And a third, another thing: Was your mother These like are to too many questions, mom? sir? I will shut I up. can only handle three. <laughs> First, uh, are there are, are are white Christians not 50 percent of the population yet? I'm guessing that you are asking that in response to something Amy said yeah. that there's no majority no, group in no, the country. But no. what she meant by that is that even among a you know, greater than 50% white Christian majority, there are subgroupings. So that, oh, okay. you know, conservative white Christians will feel that they're in a minority in this country. They're beset by, you know, mainstream media. Everybody now identifies in some way with a group that makes him or her part of an outsider. It's, it's so rare for somebody just to feel like they're majority. I think that's, that's yeah. what you meant. On, yeah. the, okay. on, the, on the Jewish sure. immigrant business, mm. this is really exaggerated. Uh, sir, I, I really think I, there was, of course there's a history of education culture. Uh, it is thousands of years old. But the millions of Jewish immigrants who came from Eastern Europe and Russia from 1900 to 1920, they were largely uneducated, like my grandfather, a butcher, who had no particular education. And you can find in the biographies and autobiographies of so many of these men, they say, you know, we hear all, I'm talking about Jews who then uh, rose and, and started writing, you know, memoirs and stuff in the middle of the 20th century. We hear so much about Jewish education, culture, the Torah, all this. We can tell you, our parents, our fathers, they didn't have it. They were uneducated tailors. They wanted us to go to laundry college. And I'm quoting Stanley Schachter, a very uh, influential social psychologist, and Nathan, <clears throat> Nathan Glazer says the exact same thing. This just wasn't true of the groups of the, of the families that we came from or of the families that we knew growing up in those, uh, on the Lower East Side. So um, there's that. Now, the uh, third thing that he asked about w was... Security. Uh, oh, security. so the, the gentleman said, maybe we should understand it as like kind of a group superiority feeling that for some of these groups, they're members of a group that they feel a sense of exceptionality, but they combine that with an individualized sense of insecurity. And that's exactly what we say. That, oh. We could, couldn't agree with you more. That's for, now, the sense of exceptionality doesn't have to come from a group, but in these groups that we're looking at, it often does. And it's the combination of that with an individualized sense of insecurity that seems to be doing the driving work. Like you, you get this sense that, oh, you're, you're from this great group, but you haven't proven it yet. You've got to do this. You've got to be a doctor. You've got to be a president. You've got to be uh, uh, getting 100 instead of a 99. Yes. 
Uh, I came late, so maybe you talked about this, but I grew up just the way you, I'm Jewish. I graduated from Yale Law School a long time ago. I did that for 12 years, and uh, then I got bored and went to medical school, and now I do that. Um, I was a good student. Um, and a lot, of this, a lot of this success has come through education. Uh, we were all outsiders, and we didn't have parents who owned corporations, so uh, this was a way an individual could make their way. Things are changing. Um, yes, the Republicans talk about education all the time. We need more education. But the fact is that something like 44% of college graduates between, I don't know, 25 and 35 or 20 and 35 are underemployed. They are in jobs that don't require college educations. And if education isn't the way anymore, I mean, it's not the, it's not the great thing that it used to be, uh, does that change the way you think? Well, I, I, you're, you're, you're pinpointing a huge problem. It is true that these groups that we're looking at, they focus on education because they think it's the ladder to success. You're That's saying, right. well, it what was. if it isn't? It's going to be a serious problem, and it's becoming harder. But don't forget, even though what you're saying is true, it is so much harder to make a living now with just a high school education. So sure. 20 years ago in the United States, you can do the data on this, people with just a high school education 20, 30 years ago could, without too much trouble, make the median income. Now it's almost impossible. It's really difficult. So while the value of a college education is going down, the value of a high school education is going down even worse. So, it, so what you're saying is, is true, but don't forget the other side as well. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, um, among the three qualities that you focus on here, you seem to consider impulse control as less important, if I, if I understood you correctly. And I'm wondering if you have an empirical basis for that, for really subordinating that. I thought I heard you say that you thought that was less, oh. less oh, yeah. important. No, I think I just ran out of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I gave less. Uh, no, we, we actually, at the end of our book, we say that that is... Um, the m most important, but for a different reason, we say that that is actually the way in. That's the the way in for individuals, right? Because um, the, the there's a lot of problematic stuff with superiority complexes. Um, obviously, as we treat in the book, superiority complexes at the extreme have led to apartheid, slavery, genocide. I mean, again, there's a reason that we you know we we know that this term um, is very ambivalent, but at the end, where we're, we're talking about the United States, um, you know, there are different, it depends what the content of the superiority com uh, complex is. And if the content um, of the superiority complex is not some group you belong to, some ethnicity, some family, but rather it's based on your own hard work and what you've earned and perseverance, that is a sense of superiority that you earn, like I was saying about the skier, you know, through just hard work and perseverance, then that's a sense of superiority that I think is is honorable. Um, and that is done through impulse control. That is, a, that's the link. That's a superiority complex ba through, you know, that is that anybody can access. Not that it's remotely easy. I mean, we, you know, it, it is n people, some people face much steeper hills. But uh, but anyway, I, we didn't mean to um, diminish the, that, that one at all. Okay. Um, we do say that, uh, contrary to a lot of the grit and willpower literature, that that's not sufficient. A lot of people say, why isn't it just um, that you, you know, have a lot of discipline? Well, by itself, if you're extremely disciplined. You could be an ascetic. You could just, you could starve. You, could, you know, it's, you need ambition. You need, you need drive, too, and that's what the first two things right. do. Well, can I generalize the question then, maybe just a little bit? Um, you, you already alluded to the problems of measuring success and disagreement on that. But just the problem of measuring the three qualities in order to develop any correla correlative uh, relationships and so forth. How do you, can you talk about the problems? I, I, I couldn't understand how you could subordinate one of the three when you can't measure the three very well. So Yeah, I, we don't have any uh, metrics that would allow us to precisely measure the extent or quantity of any of these qualities. You're right. I mean, the, um, the people have tried. Now, there are empirical studies out there that actually validate the um, uh, uh, causal power of all three of these qualities to produce better outcomes. So you, how many people have heard of the marshmallow test? Okay, the most famous test in social science. They put three, four, five-year-old kids at a table. They put a marshmallow in front of them. You can eat up the marshmallow right now, or you can wait 15 minutes, and you get a second marshmallow. Most of them ate the first marshmallow. About a third of them didn't. 
They tracked the kids 25 years later. They didn't mean to. It was almost an accident by the researchers. They tracked them, and 25 years later, the few, the third, that didn't eat the marshmallow, that waited, were doing wildly better on educational uh, measures, uh, income measures, uh, 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 stronger families, out of jail more, um, uh, uh, um, <laughs> and uh, a host of other measures. So uh, that's impulse control, but it's not only impulse control. The uh, Amish have great impulse control, so it's not enough. But, uh, and the other uh, uh, qualities have been, so people have tried to time it. Well, how long do they wait? Four minutes, six minutes, and they, they try to quantify it. We don't try to do that, and we don't think the, the measures are out there, although you know, I wish they were. Well, let me just answer that. I mean, um, look, this is, uh, it's an original hypothesis. Um, we think that it has enormous explanatory power, much more, and that it can, our theory can explain phenomenon that others can't. Now, that's what we think. And Jed already mentioned this, but for example, there are more comforting things that people want to say that it's all, who, this is what determines who is successful now, who your parents are. Right, and that's very comforting because then it's not controversial. It's it's just you know you you got you had parents that were more educated, they were wealthier, but that kind of an explanation that is an immigrant selection or, or inherited wealth thing doesn't explain. And let, I'll just repeat, drive, okay, and networking is one that you'll hear. So let me the the um, white uh, elite WASP establishment in the 30s, 40s, 50s, they had more human capital than anyone in this country. They had better education. They were at all the private schools. Uh, and they had certainly more old boy networks than anybody. But that, they didn't have the drive. I mean, that's this is not us, which is in other books that, you know, how that group was slowly replaced uh, in, in the Ivy League. So so that that's one thing um, that the other theories can explain. They also, the, these more comforting theories also, uh, well, for one thing, they can't explain the persistence of Jewish success. I think people just don't want to talk about that. When they're criticizing us, they never, they always use other examples because that is very awkward um, because Jews are now not immigrants. Only, I think 16%, they're, you know, fifth generation. And our theory locates that in insecurity, right? Because they may be, maybe they were second generation immigrants, just like, um, but in most immigrant groups, that's when you start to get more comfortable. You're not hungry anymore. You don't think your kids are going to starve. You loosen up. Um, you know, that's the beginning of what you might call generational decline. In this country, though, in 1945, that was erupted, interrupted by the Holocaust. And there's a long history and literature of this, this you know, the history of persecution. Um, so that's a very, uh, you know, the Mormon case is also very interesting. And finally, um, I think the other, you know, when people, uh, in our book, actually, we talk about status collapse. We say that with the groups like Cuban Americans and uh, Iranian Americans, part of that dynamic is precisely that they came from higher status, respected professions, were confiscated, lost a lot, then came to this country. And that's what gave them that resentment. But these other explanations, um, can't they don't have a transmission mechanism so you so somebody has no money they're from cuba they have five dollars but they were once a doctor in cuba how the key is how do they translate that to the next generation right because uh it's they, they can't be doctors now they didn't have the licenses they had to be janitors and food pickers and that's kind of what our book is about what are they translating what are they signaling and instilling in their children that is creating both the drive and the ability to realize it so so that's kind of where we see them you know like we have a hypothesis and we would welcome counterexamples or other theories that can explain the phenomena better so I'll just add one last thing to that, which is this phenomenon of generational decline again, which I mentioned before. So in virtually every group where you see group success in America, the finding is, and this is not us, this is the data that's out there, it stops after the second generation. Third generation begins to dissipate. Our explanation, this cultural explanation, precisely captures that phenomenon, which you see time and time again. We're talking about, you can go back to the 100 years ago to the Italian immigrants, the Irish immigrants, and before them, None of the other explanations can capture that because they're like, you know, it's about something IQ or structural or think about it you, or, or immigrant selectivity. None of the other explanations can capture that. 
I, I think you guys actually nailed it with this hypothesis with the uh, three elements, the three factors. What's troubling to me is that I think you dismiss uh, genetics a little too quickly. Now, that obviously, that would make the hypothesis even more controversial, but we know that impulse control is one of the most heritable uh, qualities in human uh, nature, and we know that insecurity is very much tied in with temperament, which is something that we're born with. So I wonder, did you guys consult with uh, behavioral geneticists, ge uh, uh, behavioral scientists, to really come up with this, or because it's all nurture, 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 rather than nature via nurture. Well, I do think that the fact that third generation Asian Americans aren't outperforming the rest of the country simply refutes the idea that there's a genetic difference that was driving their impulse control before. I really do. So I, I think it's a very clean case. But what we also know from the actual experiments that have been done on willpower and impulse control is that it can be strengthened. So um, uh, people have been studying this. While there may be a, a heritable component, it has been conclusively proven that you can strengthen people's willpower, impulse control, and it's not that hard to do. And by um, uh, uh, making kids do um, uh, focused activities and, and impulse control requiring stuff at an early age, it has been shown that you can increase it. Insecurity, I, I don't know if there's a genetic component or, or not, but uh, um, in fact, psychologists have tried to go out and, and, and measure, like the Vietnamese American community, tried to see whether they're psychologically different from other communities uh, in terms of their answers to the usual survey tests. And they couldn't find that as an explanation of why they were outperforming educationally so well. Researchers went in and did this. They gave them the surveys, tested the, to see if there was a, you know, some kind of difference. And what they found is, no, it is the expectations from the parents that are driving the success. Yes, sir. Hi, um, I think you nailed it. Uh, so my my drive was defined by a belief that I belong, like I, that I, need, I needed to be successful and I belong, I belong there, with the prevailing insecurity of growing up in an environment where, you know, in gang culture, a mother was on drugs, I was poor. And so I was afraid that if I didn't do well in school, I was gonna die. And I mean, that's how it was. And then when I got to college, it was kind of like, okay, there's Asian kids here, there's Nigerian kids, there's Ghanaian kids, and this African American kid has no culture, so I needed to I needed to, sh to show them that I belong there as well. And so now I'm sitting here, I'm in Johns Hopkins now, and you know I made it. But I think so. The, the question I want to ask though is, do you think that um, the American majority's um, superiority complex defined by a belief in American dream, American exceptionalism, uh, exceptionalism, upward mobility, coupled with uh, Amer the American uh, majority uh, ins uh, insecurity, defined by a belief that all of those things are going away, a loss of upward mobility, uh, a loss of capitalism, uh, prevailing uh, sh uh, great uh, shifts in cultural norms and, uh, dem and great demographic shifts, do you think that's going to prevent the country from moving forward as a whole. And the, the thing that really brought that question to me was this Coca-Cola commercial at the Super Bowl, where it was a commercial and the, uh, the either the American Anthem or the America the Beautiful was sung in a lot of different languages. And the response was, was negative. You know, you need to speak American. Where are all these foreigners doing speaking, you know, speaking, you know, American, yada, yada. I thought, wow, this is America. We we have Coca-Cola in every country in the world. This is, I mean, the definition of American success. But people were saying that this was the definition of, like, not being American. So I, do you think that's going to prevent the country's success in the future? Well, first of all, thank you um, for your nice words. And the one we, we actually haven't had any nice words at all. So, uh, so um, um and and also congratulations. Um, uh, well, our America chapter is you know we can't it's it's more of a thought experiment our last chapter but we actually touch on all these things that you're talking about because once it's complicated enough you know the metrics and how uh, to talk about a whole nation that is so many but just kind of loosely speaking we. Um, kind of agree with you. We say that America in many ways was founded a kind of triple package country. Everybody knows about American exceptionalism. City on a hill, you know, we were going to have a, a, a superior a capitalist democratic system. Uh, for most of our history, we had the insecurity of being an underdog, right? Is um, 
there, we have some fun sections on our founding fathers. Such a chip on the shoulder vis-a-vis -vis Europe because Europe was more aristocratic. They were more cultured. Thomas Jefferson actually sent a giant moose cal uh, uh, carcass to the France Museum to show that we had bigger animals than Europe. Um, <laughs> And and so throughout, and, oh, impulse control was you know the Puritans and and, and Ben Franklin, but now to your question now, um, one of the things that we say is that uh, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, that was the first time in American history that America actually no longer was an underdog. You know we we know we finally had no rival. It was also the 80s and 90s. People felt they were making a lot of money. I mean a little bit exaggerated who was really getting it, but it was so that we um, in some ways partly because of our success, partly because of we were a hyperpower, everybody seemed to want to be like us, um, uh, had plenty of the superiority complex, which by itself we say, without being tempered by insecurity <laughs> and impulse control, is just swagger. Um, and uh, so I wasn't sure where, the second part of what you were saying is, I, in a weird way, the adversity, you know, things have not gone so well necessarily, financial crisis, we've made some mistakes, rise of China, terrifying everybody, you know, in some ways, maybe it's an opportunity, right? America has always been at its best when it has to prove its mettle. Um, so maybe that's a partial. Can I just say one thing? I thought it was just a great question. And I, I, so at the end of the book, we think about, should we be in favor of America getting its triple package back? And that depends on what its content is. That depends a lot on what kind of superiority complex it has. And that's what we talk about at the end because superiority complexes are dangerous. Countries do terrible things based on, and peoples do terrible things based on superiority complex, believing they're superior. To, and America's superiority complex, as we all know, has been based for hundreds of years in part on a chauvinism or jingoism or even racial beliefs that we all deplore. And what we say at the end of the book is if we can if we could have an American superiority <coughs> complex based on inclusivity, uh, this goes to your point about the Coca-Cola commercial, inclusivity and equality and tolerance, that would be a superiority complex worth a sense of exceptionality worth aspiring to. Mm -hmm. And we just don't know which kind Americans will, will have. And I think our time is up. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.